reading from John chapter 20, starting in verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both, both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Good morning, church. Good morning. I was thinking about how good you look. Everybody's dressed up and looks good. and It's not just the fact that you're dressed up is that you've chosen to be assembled in the name of Jesus Christ this morning. And that looks good. Glad that you're here. And I want to talk about uh, the resurrection. I've been talking the lesson, resurrection, it's a big deal. And I intend it as a double entendre. We're going to talk about a couple of meanings of that title, resurrection, it's a big deal. But I'm going to start with the most obvious one, is just what is the significance of the resurrection. Is it significant? Why is it significant? And I hope to touch on some things that help to answer that question. I want us to start out with this idea that Jesus came to die for us and to pay for our sins. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, and many passages we could go to, John says he is a propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of of the whole world. By show of hands, how many of you use the word propitiation this week? That's <laughs> yeah, a big church word, right? We don't use the word propitiation, but it means a satisfaction. That there's something of debt and inequity that needed to be satisfied, and he is that propitiation. He is that satisfaction of the debt that stood against us came and he died. I was thinking as we pretend for the Lord's Supper, I got it off. How about now? All right. Want me to start over? Okay. <laughs> no, please don't. We're praying. As we think about this idea that he is the propitiation of our sins, He's the payment. I was thinking of him as we've taken the Lord's Supper, the passage in 1 Corinthians where Paul says, as often as we do this, as, as, as often as we're gathered together and we drink this bread and we eat this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And, and I generally think about his death in, in, in the communion, but he's saying, look, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Every time we eat that bread and we drink that cup, we're proclaiming the Lord's death. And if you just kind of end your thought process there, you're missing some of it, right? We proclaim the Lord's death, what? Until He comes. We, we don't eat and drink to a dead Savior. We, we don't eat and drink to someone who ceased to exist. No, we eat and drink to a Savior who died. But He's coming. And we keep proclaiming that over and over again until He comes. We understand that He died for our sins. He's a propitiation, the payment for our sins. I think about the idea and this idea that the resurrection is a big deal is that Jesus could not be held by death. Paul writes in Romans 6 verses 8 and following, Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. How amazing is it that Jesus proclaimed, if you 
tear down this temple, I'll rebuild it in three days. He understood, they understood that he claimed he was going to get up and walk out of the tomb that they would place him in. It's one thing to say that, and it's another thing to do that. You have the idea that Jesus gives himself on the cross, and there's a huge theological idea. Did they kill him, or did he lay down his life? And the answer is yes. But he dies. Satan thinks he has him. Satan thinks he's conquered him. But death could not contain him. And he gets up out of the tomb. And there might have been a three-day window, a three days and three nights window, as it says in Scripture. This, not the window part, but the three days and three nights that Jesus is in the tomb. But early on the first day of the week, he gets up and leaves. And at that point, death no longer has dominion over him. And by extension, those who come to Christ, death no longer has dominion over them because... He is ruling over death. And we look at this idea that it was necessary for Him to be raised. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Since therefore the children share in the flesh and blood, He Himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death He might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. There's... A theological hole we could jump in and swim around for a while. We'll mention it, but we won't spend much time there is, is that Scripture says in, in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin is death. And we're talking about the sinless one. So the idea is, is that if we die, it's, we brought it upon ourselves in a sense. We owe to death because we sinned. We rebelled against God and the, the wage of that sin is death, Right? But what about one who's never sinned? He he didn't owe a death. But it was necessary. The death was necessary. Because it was necessary for Jesus to come and share in flesh and blood like we have. He partakes in that flesh and blood. He becomes flesh and blood. The God who spoke the world into existence. John chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1. He speaks the world into existence and then becomes a part of His creation and lives on this earth in the flesh. Why? That He might destroy the one who has the power of death. That He might deliver those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. It was necessary for him to die and necessary for him to be raised from the dead. You see, without Jesus' resurrection, we have no hope. A passage I often use in, and, and preachers do often use this in a funeral service of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13, but I want you to notice that last little line in it. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as do others who have no hope. You see, without Jesus' resurrection, we have no hope. It's those who have participated in the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. Those who've placed their faith in the resurrection of Christ who have hope. And those who have not done that have no hope. But because of His resurrection, we do have hope. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again, what? To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so I want us to understand that this idea of resurrection, this idea uh, that we come together, not only this Lord's Day, but every Lord's Day, and proclaim the Lord's death till He comes, we are always looking at the resurrection of Jesus. It's because it's important. It's a big deal. And it's through the resurrection that we see our pasts differently. I look back on my past and I see my rebellion. I see the death that I lived in, which is an oxymoron, but if you understand it spiritually, you understand. The hopelessness that I lived in. The wrath that I lived in. 
And I don't know if you have a Bible with you or a Bible containing device or if you're following along, but I encourage you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. And I want you to listen to this idea of how looking at our past through the resurrection means something. He says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of, our bo- of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. See, it's through the resurrection of Jesus that I come to a clear view, a clear understanding about my past. I tend to want to write it that I was a good old boy. I I was a good guy. I I know I've a mix of good and bad, but overall a pretty good guy. Right? That's how I want to paint myself. But somehow through the resurrection of Christ, we see ourselves clearly. We see our past clearly. We see it differently. Through the resurrection of Jesus, we see our present differently. You see, we are those who have died. We've died to self, we've died to sin, and yet we still live. And and, and we look at that in Romans chapter 6 and verse 18, and just read all of Romans 6 and you'll get it. But we're raised up to live this new life. And through the resurrection of Jesus, how do I view my life? What, What is my life all about? Is it about my desires, my goals, my enjoyment, my rights? Or do we find that because of the resurrection, we changed our priorities? We changed that which is most important in our life. And we look at our present differently because not only does the resurrection change my view of my past and my view of my present, but it changes and most significantly my view of the future. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 19, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. You see, we don't just have a hope that's in this world. We have a hope that takes us out of this world, through this world, into the next world. I was someone who had no future other than hell itself. We would have no future other than that if it weren't for Christ and for His resurrection. But we become those who through the resurrection have no future other than heaven. What can mere man do to me? In this life I'm going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Jesus says, I have overcome the world. We're reminded of the familiar passage in John 14 and verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. You see, life is different. Because the resurrection allows me to see my future differently. I want you to turn, if you'd like, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I promise you at one point, I had a marker. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 54. He spent a whole chapter talking about our resurrection. And as he's coming toward the end of his argument, toward the end of this passage, he says these words, When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. You see, it's through the resurrection of Christ 
that I view my life different. I live, view my past, my present, my future differently. It changes my perspective. It changes my priorities. And as I live my life, I no longer live it for me, but I live it for Him. Because not only was Jesus raised from the dead, He promised to raise me too. Now, I've written a little story, or I've written some bullet points to remind myself how to tell this story, and it's an illustration, and it falls short. I wanted to improve the story and make it better, but I'm going to try to share the story with you anyway. All right? Just know it's got some holes in it, all right? Jesus was a lot better at parables than I am. I want you to imagine that someone near and dear to you, a family member, a close friend, someone that you love with every fiber of your being has gotten sick. They've seen doctor after doctor. and No one could help. A hope has been lost. Things have turned grave. Your loved one is unconscious barely holding on. A stranger comes and offers you some hope. He enters the room, places his hands on your loved one, and a strange transfer begins to happen. Your loved one begins to show signs of life. The stranger shows signs of sickness. As the scene continues, a The stranger slumps over, falls to the floor dead. About that time, the loved one sits up, feeling refreshed, feeling as they've never felt better. And and as they begin to talk to you, and as you're filled with so many questions, and as you're standing there over the body of this stranger, they tell of a silent conversation that they had had with the stranger. Do you want to live? I will give you life to the fullest if you'll follow my ways. Will you do it? Unless the world ends, you will get sick again. You'll get old and injured. You're going to die once more. But don't worry. I will not remain dead. In fact, in three days, I'm going to get up and be alive. And not many days after that, I'm going to leave here. But don't worry. I'm going to come back. I'm going to raise you up, as I'm doing now. But this next time, I'm going to change your body into one that will never die. And also, I will never leave you again. Deal? You see, that's the other deal. The resurrection is a big deal because it's important, it's central to our faith. But there's also an idea, the resurrection is a big deal. There's an implication in it as well. Not only is it a big deal and significant because of what Jesus has done, it's significant because of what Jesus has offered. Look, I'm willing to, to raise you up, raise you up to walk a new life, to follow after me, to be transformed into my image. I want you to be absolutely... Faithful to me, and I'll give you life if you'll die to self. Deal? You see, through the resurrection of Christ, we view our past differently. We view our present differently. We view our future differently because of what we believe. And so I ask you, Have you come to Christ? Do you belong to Him? He he died for you and was raised that you may be certain that He has the power to raise you up on the last day. He was able to get up out of that tomb. He was able to raise me out of mine. One last verse as we close up. Found in Revelation 1, 17 and 18. John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. 
But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys to death and Hades. You see, he calls you to come. He calls you to die to yourself. He calls you to be united with Him in His death and baptism. He calls you to be raised up with Him in baptism in order that you might walk and begin a new life with Him. He calls you to a life where you live for Him because of His resurrection and the promise He gives you of your own. Deal? The lesson is yours. If we can serve you in some way, won't you come while we stand and sing? Worthy is the Lamb.